Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and uh, we've got a very special guest, Brother Ron Gunter, uh, and uh, he has come on with us today to share some of uh, his experiences in life, and I am sure it's going to be experiences that you will find very fascinating, and, uh, and, and so it is my privilege to introduce him to you. Uh, Ron Gunner, thank you, brother, for coming on with us here. And uh, I, I know my wife has had uh, an encounter with a spacecraft in her life. Her brother was abducted uh, by extraterrestrial ent entities. Uh, now, when he got abducted, it wasn't because he, he had seen the spacecraft. They were together when they saw it when she was about 14 years old. And uh, she said it was probably about 100 yards uh, away from the road, hovering over a field, kind of like a, uh, she said, like a cigar type shaped craft. And um, it was her nephew that saw it first. He was a little boy. He started screaming, look, 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 look out the window. They looked and sure enough, they pulled the car over. Her brother actually decided to walk out to it. And uh, he got about halfway there before the thing flew off. Well, then later, uh, he began to experience these tall entities that were much bigger than him. And he is a, he's a big old guy, uh, and he's not afraid to fight. But uh, he ended up getting abducted, and, uh, and not once, but more than once, Brother Ron. And uh, he would have bruises all over his body where he would fight to try to keep from being taken uh and he tried to tell his family what happened but no one believed him anyway with that i set the stage for you just to share some things that you've been through in your life as well well brother steve i'll tell you what from the time i was very small things started happening and I don't know, I guess I can just start back when I was real young. But when I was two, my mother and dad went to, uh, it's on the White River, the North Fork. And uh, it's called Tecumseh, named after an Indian chief. But we were down there and I was two. And dad was fishing under the bridge. And it's one of those places where it flashed flood. And the water was up really high, and I mean rolling, you know. And mom had my sister and brother over on the blanket, and I went over to fish with dad. And uh, mom hollered at dad and said, where did he go? And he said, oh, I don't know. I thought you had him over there, you know. So anyway, they looked around for about, she said it's probably 10 or 15 minutes. And she was sitting on the bank, you know, crying. Dad said he probably fell in the river, you know. And all of a sudden I come crawl. He saw the top of my head come out of the water and I was crawling on the bottom. And oh my goodness. he said, dad won't talk. Well, he wouldn't talk about it at all. He, he said, there's something not right there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> His son is Aqua Boy. <laughs> yeah, he was one That reminds me of that movie, right? Uh, or something like that, Aquaman or some, uh, uh, it's a long time, I forget now, back what, in the 80s, I guess, they had some movie like that yeah. where the guy could breathe underwater. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I guess after that, you know, at one point, and I couldn't tell you how old I was, I had this kind of a dream or vision or something that I was on kind of on a table, but I was in like a fetal position. I was small and these people around me, you could tell they were very tall, but I don't know. You know, I think there's good ones and bad ones. And if you'd like, I'll tell you why. <laughs> sure. Sure. Absolutely. Because you know, even when I've always said to people, I've never known any of them to be benevolent. This is from where this is information you just get from people in the intel circles that would share that thought with you. Uh, so you're I've heard before people say there are benevolent entities. Now, 
and I can believe that under the respect of even like in the when we look at the Bible, right? If you look at the angels that come to the prophets and stuff, in reality, in some people's view or mind, that would be considered like an alien because let's face it, the angels are not earthly beings. Well, for example, like that, I guess Ezekiel would be a good one in the first chapter. The uh, messengers from God that came to him landed with a wheel within a wheel. Exactly. Uh, you know, they were evidently good people or good creatures, whatever you call them, uh, because if they were sent by God to give a message, I would say that was pretty good. But the other thing is, is they say, if you see a, uh, some kind of an alien craft, you know, you better run because it's bad. Well, you probably run anyway because it's something you wasn't really used to, you know. But I think if the bad angels that were cast down, if that was their mode of travel, why wouldn't the other angels still have that same mode? Or, you know, I don't know. But I've never really had what people call a bad experience with any of it. Like when I was seven, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, I woke up at, it's 12.05 because the clock was right beside my bed there. And we had those big long windows that went all the way almost to the floor. And I walked over and looked out because it looked like the sun was shining. And you could see even the gravel and the ground and stuff. It was that, but it's more like a white light. But over the top of the trees in the south, it looked like the sun was shining. And that really confused me because, you know, back then they taught, you know, the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. And I sat down on the bed and was trying to figure that out. And I thought, well, I guess I don't know. And I looked up the clock and it was 320. So you know, as somewhere I lost some time there, you know. Wow. But like I said, it, you know, a lot of things went on like that. Even when I got injured in 1987, I was 50 feet up on a silo and uh, I was pulling an inspection cover off and all of a sudden the ladder broke out of the concrete and it hit my knees and when it did, uh, you know, I looked down. I remember looking down. There's a brand new tri screw under me. Well, I didn't want to tear that up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I ran my arm in behind the ladder. I don't know how, if I went down a few rungs, but it tore my shoulder and neck and back out at the time. And I was off work for three years. But the thing was is... I don't know how I got back up on the ladder when I was hanging by my arm and I don't know how I got down. I was all of a sudden on the ground and I was walking and I was looking back up trying to figure out how did I get down here? And I was, I, I mean, I don't know, hmm. but when these preachers were talking to me, uh, I couldn't really look at them. It's like it wasn't allowed or something, but they were telling me, you know, as a child, you're going to have a rough time and stuff because you're different. You know, you're going to be different than other kids are. You're going to be more caring and stuff like that. And kids can be rude, you know. So anyway, they were right about that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, got through all of it. But, you know, there were so many things that happened over that time that when I, after I got injured like that and I still have the scars, mm. uh, the uh, funny thing was when I started the school, I decided to go get an engineering degree and uh, I couldn't hardly move my arm or my fingers or anything like that. And it'd been what, almost a year and a half then. And, uh, one night I went to sleep and that same kind of thing happened where I was in the fetal position and all I, I heard this in my head, but I never heard any sound out. It's almost like telepathy or something. 
and it said, look what they've done to his arm. And that was all I remembered about it. But when I got up the next morning, you know, I could move it and do it and been doing it ever since. So evidently, you know, that's what I say. I don't think all so of them. You didn't bad. have mobility with your hand uh, the night before when you went to bed. And then the next morning you actually had a better mobility with your hand. Right. Wow. I know that sounds crazy, but that's well, what yeah. happened. But let, let me let me say this just to kind of clarify for people too, because um Gary Lowry, and Gary's been on here with us before, and he's talked about the abduction that he went through, uh, him and his <clears> actual <throat> whole family. He said in the beginning, the only person that ever would remember things was his daughter. And she would talk about it quite frequently. And he thought at first she was like losing it. You know, she's a little girl and she'd be talking about being taken up to the spaceship and stuff. Finally, somewhere along the way, he began to remember himself. And then he remembered the bits and pieces that she would talk about. And he said what it was when they would get ready to send them back to Earth. He said they have a device, kind of like what you see in that movie Men in Black, where they can just erase your memory and send you back. He says, but it's not effective on everybody. And uh, I remember uh, one of the guys I knew in D.C., he had said that to me. He said, they he said we were given the same technology uh, by <clears throat> the extraterrestrials to be able to erase memories like if they were to take and the government takes you captive, they can erase the memory, put you back society, and you never know that you were taken by them. He said, but it doesn't work on everybody. So it would make sense where you remember little bits and pieces, but not realize that you were taken, but yet suddenly something's different in your body. So that's interesting. But over the years, I've had several times where I've lost time. And it's real puzzling because it doesn't seem like anything happened at all, you know. But like, for instance, I lived in Kansas City for about 15 years. And a lot of things happened up there. One night I was sitting, we lived in a neighborhood where back behind us, a lot of elderly people lived. And they were all real friendly and everything. But one night I was set up on the bed. I don't know why. It was about, I think it's about one o'clock, somewhere around there. But I turned around and looked and I saw blue and red lights flashing outside. And I thought, ah, uh, that old man across the street there, you know, he got sick or something. Right. So I reached for the curtain. And as soon as I, almost touched the curtain that's the last thing i remember and the next thing i consciously remember i was sitting on the edge of the bed and i happened to look and i thought did i look out the window or what did i do you know oh uh, well i don't know and i turned around and the clock said 4 15 or something like that. It was a long time later but there uh People that were with me, like I'd stand on the deck at night, they would see the things that I was seeing too. Mm. And uh, we had one that was really huge and it was a triangle shape, but it was only probably four to 500 feet up. But I bet the span of that thing was close to 400 feet. I mean, it was huge and it, had a little light on each tip back there and a couple down the side and it was moving over. At first I thought the stars weren't out. It was cloudy. And right. then I got to looking and if you looked long enough, you could see the outline of it and it was very, very quiet and it just barely moved really slow across there and kept on going. But in Kansas city, I mean, up there, it was really active a lot. I mean, there were so many times I saw them, you know. Do you do you ever re have any conscious memory of uh, entities uh, when you have gone places before? Uh, they were showing me several things. I don't know what type these were, but the ones I saw, 
and it was on their ship and they were showing me how the ship operated uh, by putting your hand on a pad and you could move it forward or backwards. But the pad, it was real smooth and you could feel it move when it did that like that, you know, and I was pretty amazed by that. But they had little white spots on the front. They looked a little bit like the grays, but they had white spots across the top of their forehead. I'd never seen that before. And they, uh, several times I was shown how you can leave your body. And when you can, apparently you can go interdimensional or time travel or anything like that. And I didn't, I didn't know that, but. They took me. That, I think that's what they were showing you is that you can do that by leaving your body, and, and I guess that's what they, what they're doing on something like that, brother Ron. I would assume would be like remote viewing. Is that right? Is that it would be similar to the same thing? The really odd thing about it, they took me to a place. It looked like a pyramid because the walls were sloped with torches on them, but. I was walking barefoot and I could feel that loamy soil between my toes and stuff. And I thought, how can you feel it when you're out of your body, you know? Right. But anyway, they had showed me a sarcophagus and had a beautiful lady in it. They said her name was Desiree. And back at that time, I hadn't really heard that name very much, but uh, I never did get to find out exactly who she was. But all of a sudden, uh, this one said, you have to go back now. And all of a sudden, I was in my living room, and it's like you're flying down the hallway. And whoever it was there, uh, I passed him in the doorway, and I got to my body first. Evidently, they can take your body if you're gone. You know, I don't know. But anyway... This guy's name, I found, I knew who it was, come to find out. It was Darius, but I have no idea who that was. But he looked Egyptian, had the, you know, the markings and everything on him like that. But you could tell that look on his face, he was evil, you know. And then all of a sudden, he just vanished into the wall, you know. Now, I remember you telling me a little bit about that before and what really, really impressed me was that when he was trying to get to your body, this is when you found out as a soul, because it's like your soul is outside of your body or, or your spirit, or however that would be. I don't understand. Sometimes I know that people say soul, spirit, is it one and the same? I don't know all that answers there, but you said to me that you realized you had had strength or power right. like you would have never known before. If you can share that, and, I, and, and listen, guys, when y'all listen to this, I'm going to back him up on that because I had heard years ago a very similar thing that happened to a friend of mine. So I want I want Brother Ron to tell you about that, and then I'm going to, I'll confirm what he's telling you to be true. Go ahead, Brother Ron. All right, I didn't want to get too exotic and people think I was nuts, but anyway. <laughs> no, it's okay. Listen, you know, here's the thing. I always look at it like this here. It, it's not that things are nuts or anything, but people just have to have an open mind, you know what I mean? Because we don't know. We're We're in this body on this earth at this time, and we are... And we just really don't know uh, yeah. everything. So, you know, and if you ever, you know, I study a lot of ancient documents, documents that are considered biblical uh, that just didn't make canon. They were discovered much later. Who knows, did they have, you know, what they had back when they were putting the Bible together. Right. Um, and, and there are believe it or not some of the things you described i have read in these types of documents uh so historically speaking uh i've read where the apostles have talked about experiences very sim similar to what you're describing as well so i don't never you know if if, if nothing else it's interesting 
And uh, and we may have somebody that's listening that has had experiences. They're afraid to share it because they might think that somebody thinks they're nuts. You know, <laughs> I've had all kinds of crazy things happen to me. Most of mine in my life, though, uh, on 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 different types of things like escaping death. Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've escaped death. My my sister used to make the comment. She said. What is it about you? She said, you should have died so many times in your life. And she said, it's like, you never die, you know? And from a little child, she says, like, something has always wanted to kill you. And um, she used to make the little joke because we were up in Smoky Mountain. She was four, I was two, and we're walking along. She's holding my hand. And she said, and you fall over the cliff, she said, and I'm she said, and of course, she's bigger than me anyway, naturally, because she's two years older, but she's also bigger than me naturally. And uh, and she said, so I'm screaming for my mother. And she said, I'm laying on the ground because it knocked me down and I'm holding on to your hand. And she said, that was the one time I had I could have just let go. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> she, but she loved me. She just liked to say that as a joke. But uh, but yeah, she said uh you know, mm -hmm. and of course, I asked my mother about it. My mother said, you would have died. She said it was a uh, like a raging river below. And she said it was like a little cliff. And she said, you know, several stories up. She said, for you being two years old, fall 30, 40 feet like that. She said it would have killed you onto the rocks. So anyway, so yeah, uh, of course, that's not like what you've experienced in that case there. But I'm going to share a story with people similar to what you're fixing to tell people. Go ahead, Brother Ron. Well, uh, when that, what's in it, Darius, when he came back in, as soon as I hit my body, it was like he was choking me, but I couldn't see him at the time. I, I just, cause I was back in the body, but I was reaching over and slapping my wife and stuff, you know, Hey, Hey, when all this stuff happens, I could never wake her up. I have no idea why. And then when it's over, she'd just wake right up, you know. But when he grabbed me around the throat, I mean, it was like he was going to make sure he killed me, you know. And all of a sudden, it felt like this energy built up inside of me and just like it exploded and I knocked him backwards. And I set up and I was really angry then. And I said, just come on. And that's when he started to fade back into the wall. And then after a few minutes, I was sitting there, what do you mean, come on? What are you saying? <laughs> but he left me alone after that. But every time anything happened there, I could never wake my wife up. I don't know why. All right. That's an interesting thing. And I'll, and I'll share with you why. I'll give you one experience that I had myself. It's, it was definitely supernatural. Um, and I've shared this before, and Brother Ron, you may even remember this one, but it's been a long time since I spoke about it. Uh, I was about 26, 27 years old, and uh, my oldest daughter, who's now 33, I think 33, 34 years old, Kayla, somewhere right in that area there, uh, she was a little baby, and uh, and I'd woke up that morning and I had a toothache. So I got in the car, ran to the store, got some ore gel, came back, put the ore gel on the <clears> tooth. <throat> and, uh, and Kayla's sitting there crying. So she's ready to get up to eat, you know, and her mama, she just, she, her mama could sleep pretty good and she just ignore it. Right. And I'm like, can you please feed this baby? Right. <laughs> you know? And so she said, I'll take care of her in a bit. So I, I, I laid down and when as soon as I did, I put the pillow in my hand. I'm like, I don't want to hear the crying. I am going to try to go back to sleep. You know, I finally got rid of the toothache to stop. And as soon as I put the pillow on my head, Brother Ron, th there was, I call it just the presence of God came all around me. And I and I don't know why, but for some reason, it's like like something just whirling around me, just whirling. And I was paralyzed in the body, but yet at the same time, I now was outside of my body and I'm looking at myself and I'm, and it's like, I'm, it's, it's really weird. I'm laying on the bed, I'm out of the body and yet I'm looking at myself and I'm talking to God and I know I'm talking to the father, 
but I'm speaking in a language I had never heard before in my life. Huh. And, uh, and I mean, I speak Hebrew, but I didn't, of course, now at that time there, I knew a little bit of Hebrew, but nothing very much. So I don't have no idea what I was speaking. And, uh, but for some reason, that language, I just knew fluently. And, uh, and I'm speaking to him and I'm so blown away by what's happening. I decided to try to wake my wife up, right? So I was going to reach over and shake her and, and tell her that, but I couldn't, I couldn't move. The body was just totally paralyzed. And so I thought, well, I can talk, <laughs> you know? So, so I said, I went like this. I said in English, I said to her, I said, hey, get a load of this. That's exactly the very words that I tried to speak. And when my mouth opened, instead of those words coming out to her, the words that I was speaking to the father came out instead. <laughs> and I could hear those words in my ears. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to say, get a load of this, but I'm hearing something like, oh, do, 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 wah, 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 you know, N not even, doesn't sound Chinese or nothing. I can't even, I could, there's no way I could ever express those words again, right? But it comes out, I hear it. And as soon as the last word comes out, instantly, boom, I'm back in my body. I don't see myself in the vision anymore. And, and but I never, you know, Brother Ron, I felt like I never lost consciousness or anything but it was so weird it's like three different things body laying there i'm over here watching and the other guy of me is sitting there talking now, so, i've heard some language like what you're probably talking about but i have no idea what it is and i've had people that say they're experts say that uh it's a universal alien type language but i don't think they know that either really right but uh, that's pretty amazing, though. But I know what you're talking about when you have that. I've had that happen a couple of times, but this last time it was really it. I don't know how to explain it other than it was the most warm and comfortable love you could even think about, you know, and you felt like, I mean, it was just great, you know, but. Are you not uh, sure the part about the love? Because I've had those things happen before as well. And the only thing I can describe it as, um, normally it's somebody's faith that causes it to happen to me. Um, and that's what, when even like Brother Ron, when I would say to people, when I'm going to pray for them, I would say, <clears throat> or I'll explain to people, you know, before, not normally the person I'm going to pray for at the time, but for me, what it is, I learned in life through all these years that if the present, I call it the presence of love or the presence of the Holy Spirit, when, if, when I'm talking to an individual, I'm actually waiting to see if their faith moves his presence there because I don't know how to explain it. I call it love, but it's not just love. I know that he's standing there. It's literally like you feel, I can feel him in the room with me. But the love, there's no human love that will ever express that kind of love. And and, and honestly, Brother Ron, I, I have to just be honest as I can. Every time that's ever happened, I want to run. Uh, and it's not, the only way I know how to express it is I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to contain that kind of love. And But I also know, too, that if I pray for you when that happens, I know it. you're healed. It's, it's over. I don't care what any doctor were to say. I know it's totally over. Because when that love comes down, you are healed. I've seen people with the worst cancer. The doctors would say you, they've got a couple of weeks left to live. And let that, that experience happen. I don't care what they say. I know what's going to happen to you. 
And uh, well, there, like you said, there's no real words to describe that because I don't even know how to begin. It's just a, a wonderful kind of love, but it's different than the way we do it. I guess is what I would say, but right. I don't know. It was really great, but I liked the experience myself though, you know? Yes. But it's you always live in that kind of love. You want to live there. And yet, you know, and I do know that I remember the first time that ever happened to me as a lady that had no vocal cords, surgically, they were removed, but and at that that time, I didn't understand what would happen. But I guarantee you, if I could ever find that lady today, she can speak perfectly normal now. That's because great. She's the one that that happened to. And and or the first time it happened, I should say. Uh, wow. OK, brother. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I used to didn't believe really a lot of those things like that happened until I started really learning about faith and I learned a lot from your lessons too on faith. You've done a great job on that. And I'll tell you, you get your faith in there. And like you said, you can move mountains and, but you've got to really, I mean, you have to believe, you know? Yeah. And I guess we got a little bit off subject, but it was pretty interesting anyway. But when I went, when I injured my arm and everything, I did go get an engineering degree and I went to work at TWA, the airline out there. And I was getting off early one day and I thought I'll surprise my wife and I'll be 30 minutes early. <laughs> uh, that didn't work out quite the way I thought it would. On the way home, I don't know, if, most people probably be familiar with the loop around Kansas City. I was coming around the uh, northeast loop, heading south towards I-70, and just as I went under the bridge, I noticed a cloud up there. It looked like a really long cigar cloud, and I thought, boy, that's odd looking like that, and all of a sudden, this white uh, ship dropped out of it, and it looked like it kind of floated, you know, like it had no weight at all. And then it kind of stair-stepped up a little bit and then stopped. And I was looking at, I don't know, I can't even explain how I could tell you this, but it looked like an upside down white bowl, not real sharp edges, you know, but it also had like portals in the side of it. And there's no way from that distance that I could have seen that, but at the same time, in the middle of watching it, I had a, this like a vision of me looking at myself in the pickup from outside, kind of in front. And then it's like I turned and I don't remember anything else after that. And then when I started watching that again, uh, it started to glow. I don't know how to describe that other than like a crystal clear welder's art. It's just brilliant. And it just blew it away and then boof, it was gone. And the funny thing was, I remembered after I got home what was said, but I didn't at the time. I just knew I felt great all over. Well, I mean, I felt great. And I got home and my wife was mad. And I, because she had an appointment, and I went, Well, I'm here early. I mean, I took off early. She said, Well, where have you been then? Because I was 45 minutes late. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, now, were you 45 minutes later than what you said you'd be home, or 45 minutes even past the time you normally get home? It's 45 minutes after I would normally get home. I, and then I told her I took off a half hour early. Why? Well, she was pretty upset about that and when I was telling her what happened she kind of calmed down because she'd been around me long enough to kind of know what was going on she didn't like it it scared her a lot she said that's just that's nuts you know and it may be but they're there anyway but uh <clears throat> I think after she felt I got better home, afterwards though that's the good part <laughs> <laughs> 
But when I got home, I was thinking, I thought, oh, I remember that. But I only remember a piece of it. And I, I, if I was gone that long, there had to be more than that. But the thing was, as they said, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. But we are going to be gone for a long time. But we will be back. But during that time, you'll be watched and taken care of. And man, I want to tell you what, I don't know how many times I've almost had wrecks and I could not explain how I missed them. You know what I mean? And things like that. Now, was that was when you say that they told you that, that, that they'll be gone for a long time. Was that during that time uh, where you, you lost track of time when you came home work from homework early or was that from a different event? No, that was the same event. This is all one event, but the one thing that kept sticking in my mind, and I don't know why, but they said they had to leave, and I keep thinking this because the evil was coming or something, and I never did make sense of that. But looking at today, that may have been what they were talking about. I don't know. There's a lot of evil. All right, world. I'll give you another one that confirms what you're saying. There was, um, I got this from a friend of mine in California, and uh, we, we call him Caesar. He is a uh, high-ranking officer that was part of the Navy SEALs team. He's since retired. Uh, he still does missions, though, on uh, as a as a, uh, a subcontractor, and. Uh, and, and you probably remember this, Brother Ron, when I did this one here. I think it's on Patreon. Uh, the I may have made it public as well, because a lot of times I do make, you know, some of the ones on Patreon don't go public, but the, but most, a lot of them do. But what, and, and the, the weird thing is my Intel guy in Washington knew of this story because he had read the report uh, that he had submitted. So he knew details that was not told me initially, but later confirmed to be true as well. But uh, what happened was, is that they were somewhere overseas, I want to say in Africa. And this tribe of, uh, the local tribesmen there went to the military. They said, um, we have been having some alien entities come into our village and they have requested of us to have you come out to speak with them. So they ended up agreeing to do it. And uh, they, they went there and, and this, and Caesar was part of that. He was the, the, the commander to lead the, his uh, SEAL team. And so they were fully locked and loaded. And sure enough, at a certain time of the day, these entities would come in. And uh, they were, I forget how he described them to me. I want to say they were like tall grays. There's a difference between tall grays and short grays. Uh, the tall grays are the ones that, that are more, uh, they're, they're far more intelligent than uh, the uh, short grays. I, I forget all the details they told me about them. But anyway, they asked them to come out into the desert that their commander wanted to meet with our commander. And so they followed them into the desert and they're starting to get ready to go into this ravine. Well, Caesar felt like it might be a trap. So he says to his men, he said, look, I need some of you to go up on either side of the ridge there. He says, if this is a trap, we need to be ready. And uh, so they did. They positioned themselves. They get into the, into the ravine there and they stop. And the alien entity, you know, and he can't, and the weird thing was every time Caesar said, every time he would communicate with his guys, he said the entity was nowhere wasn't close enough to hear him when he would make these little real you know through his little radio that he had in his ear where he could uh dictate what they needed to do but the alien would say look stop and look back to him and he'd say 
He said, and he would talk to him with telepathy. He said, if we wanted to kill you, we would have already killed you. He said, you don't have to be afraid. We're not here to harm you. And uh, so anyway, they get to this one place and he says, we're going into here. And you'll meet my commander. And he looks at it. He says, all it is is a solid rock. So he's like, okay, we're going to go into the rock, right? So he tells his guy, he said, look, if I go in there, if I don't come out, you know where I got stuck. He said, and sure enough, he said, the alien walks right into the rock. And he says, and he says, and I just stepped and he said, next thing you know, I'm inside of the rock as well. He said, and all it was was like a portal. He yeah. said, but we could walk through it. At any rate, though, this is the point I wanted to get to about what you're saying there was when they went in there, the entities that they were meeting with said that the reptilians are coming. He said, and the ones that are coming are very evil. He said, much worse than the ones that you have on your planet now. And said that they're coming to kill you. Uh, and he said, and I can tell you now, he said, you guys don't have a way to fight off these entities. He says, we have the ability to avoid being seen by them, but you don't. And, uh, and he says, and we're not going to engage them, but we wanted to warn you about what's coming. So that makes me think about what you have shared, that perhaps that what you shared is very similar to what they're talking about as well. It could very well be, I don't know. I know there's portals around on different places and I think some of them have been set, but I don't know if they're, they probably have the ability to open and close that portal as well. But I've seen things on there like that where people, have, I've never myself gone through a portal that I know of that I remember. I'll put it like that. <laughs> yes. But there's few things like that, you know, that you get to remember or they didn't quite get it erased or whatever. But uh, I've heard a lot of stories. There was a meeting up at uh, Kansas City in, I think, 93. I believe uh, Linda Moulton Howe was hosting that meeting up there for MUFON. And boy, there was a lot of stories up there on those. Now, do you have, uh, Brother Ron, there, uh, you know, and I've heard this like with Gary, where he would say he could remember bits and pieces of different of, of times that he's gone. And of course, he's like his, yourself. He's had more than one time that this has happened. And he said, you know, his whole family has been taken on multiple occasions. He said his wife has never remembered anything. Uh, he said, but she was taken as well. Um, him and his daughter, are the only two that normally remember, he said, my daughter remembers always the details. He said, for me, they're always sketchy. He said, but eventually some things will start to come back to me. Is that similar to what you go through? Yep. It seems like sometimes bits and pieces, even now, we'll start to talk about something and all of a sudden I realize something else was there, you know. It's like it's in, in little pieces and they just slowly come out. I don't know. But I don't understand. Maybe we're not supposed to remember, you know, I mean, I don't know. I've heard people talk about having harrowing experiences, you know, about being tested and all that and i don't believe i've ever had anything like that but uh i don't know i just, a lot of it i don't understand most of it i don't understand i just <laughs> right but, now in the one case you were talking about how that they were showing you how their ship actually operated and i know that gary had mentioned to me one time something very similar to that uh it was something, I forget exactly what it was with him, but they were they were explaining to him about something and how something actually worked one time. So that's kind of interesting, too, is why they will take that time to, to share those things with us. And then, you know, and then how you can remember those type things there, you know, so it's, 
And I do know that they've talked about some people, they'll go through hypnosis just to try to remember. Like they have that one movie, and I forget the name of the movie now. It is based on a true story. Uh, the people up in Alaska that were getting abducted. And uh, of course, no, they had very bad experiences. And, uh, and I actually asked a friend of mine about that. And he said that where they were at in Alaska, he said that the entities there are very bad. And he said, and no, he said, nobody ever has a good experience from what we've ever heard from them. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, You've got some really nasty ones out there, but then you've got some that do seem to care. And Linda always said that as well. She felt that way about the, uh, uh, I think they, I think she called it the, uh, was it the Nordics or uh, not the Nordics, but the, uh, oh goodness, I forget now which ones that she called it there, but kind of like the Nordics. And she said that they always seem to be, to care more about humanity. Uh, now, this is just from what she's gathered through interviews that she's done because she's never actually, that I know of, she's never had an encounter that she's ever spoken about. Yeah. Well, I've talked to her that one time in Kansas City, and she's a pretty knowledgeable lady. But I don't she's think she's ever it. I'm sorry? She's, she's interviewed a lot of people. So you're right. She's very knowledgeable on this. But I've never heard her mention anything about having an experience of her own. I don't know. No, not that not that I'm aware of. And the one thing about Linda, for those of you that that, that, that may not, I mean, of course, I mean, knowing her personally, I've spent, uh, I met her once in life, but I spent with her three days. Uh, so every single day, uh, 10, 10, about 10, 12 hours a day uh, as uh, she was interviewing a friend of mine. And so I learned a lot about her during that time. And one thing I've learned about Linda, and even since then, when she's investigating something, she really digs deep. She doesn't want to make anything public unless she has concrete facts to back it up. Uh, you know, she goes to great lengths to be able to do that. So I really appreciate that about her as a journalist. So, uh, Brother Ron, in closing, is there anything else that you'd like to share today? Uh, and we'll have you back on again later, because I know you have other types of experiences as well that I'm sure would bless uh, people that are listening. Yeah, uh, I think that, that'll probably do it for today. But uh yeah, there's some others that we can get into again. Okay, that sounds great. If people want to be able to support the work you do or, or your, your testimony or anything, how could they contact you or if they would like to interview you uh, about the experiences that you've gone through in life, how could they reach you? Well, I could email me. It's just my name, Ron Gunter, R-O-N-G-U-N-T-E-R, at gmail.com. That's great. Ron Gunner at gmail.com. I'll include that in the description below. Uh, so if you'd like, whether it be to interview Ron or if you want to support uh, this work that he does, you can reach out to him and he can let you know exactly how you could do that. So thank you, Brother Ron, for having or coming on today. And God bless you guys for listening. We appreciate it. Thank you, Brother Steve. All right. I'm going to.